Welcome uh, to this episode number five of our deep dive into crypto and Web3 with myself, Rufus Pollock of Life Itself Labs and Stephen Beal. Today, we're going to be looking at a particular thesis, which we are terming fintech incrementalism, uh, a particular argument for blockchain and crypto. It's a position that assumes that the capitalist notion of greater financialization is an engine of progress and claims that blockchain can be a vehicle for this increase in financialization through the development of more complex blockchain-based financial products, products and the added market efficiency which will result. These kind of arguments range from everything from a better payment rail, you know, a better Visa or a better Stripe, to more efficient clearing systems for banking and other places, to full-scale innovation in financial engineering. Before we dive in, just a reminder that this is, this is part of an ongoing series that you can track at web3.lifeitself.us, where we're exploring the massive phenomenon that Web3 has become with its very bold claims made about its potential impact claims that go far beyond classical technology boosterism of better and faster to claims for the radical transformation and improvement of our economic and social systems. What we've seen is at the same time, there's this exceptional lack of agreement about these claims, even on basic points and definitions. Overall, this is an exceptionally controversial and polarizing topic with strong pro and anti camps. For example, within tech, it is one of the most controversial topics we've ever seen and significantly disagreement across across ideological lines. This series is about helping you and others make sense of what is going on and evaluating the key claims. We're starting by exploring particular hopes and aspirations in their associated ideologies. We want to emphasize before we begin one key point about our approach. Throughout this series, we are seeking to steel man the various positions, whether they're pro crypto or anti, that is, we put forward the best version of any given position, and then we evaluate it. And we do that even whether we agree or don't agree with the position. We try to provide the best version we can. So without more on that, let's dive into fintech incrementalism and responsible innovation. So let's start setting out the thesis here, Stephen. Do you want to start, start us on that path? Yeah, so this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart um, because it's one that has less ties to kind of political and reconfiguration and more toward the development of better technology and better market infrastructure. Um, so it's not necessarily saying that we're going to like reconfigure society anyway, we're just going to make versions of it more efficient. Uh, and we're going to basically offer, you know, things that can't exist in the past. We're going to create them and kind of create new ways of financializing different aspects of our lives. And I think what's really, really important is that we want to touch on is like this term responsible innovation which is the term that everybody's talking about right now, given the latest executive order from uh, the US federal government. Um, and I think responsible innovation is something that we're gonna touch on because it really goes to the heart of like, um, how should we do innovation within financial services and like, who should we be serving? And like, how do we take into account externalities uh, and public interest um, when we're factoring in you know, creative destruction and innovation? That's a really, that's a really good point. And let's start here then in this thesis, this kind of like the, the, the pro version of like the potential of blockchain and crypto here, which is that kind of the crypto assets, blockchain, or even like kind of fintech more broadly, is a force for affecting change in financial services and building a more stable, efficient and transparent economy. I mean, to put that in the crudest sense, it's like more efficient, I can make payments rather than for 3% or whatever, I can make it for half a percent, or simply that we have more liquid, more stable markets going on, et cetera. And in a sense, sometimes we want to emphasize, maybe sometimes blockchain is almost just a meme. It, it represents a general uh, version of, of a way or a catalyst for building better market infrastructure and how the, you know, how the kind of enterprise software sausage actually gets made. And it is worth emphasizing here, I think you, you can make this point too, but there's a lot of legitimate real-time gross settlement systems uh, to a first approximation look like an append-only ledger that batches transactions via a consensus algorithm. If you're thinking of settling, settlement in stock markets, in even in banking or whatever, 
The difference we might say from currently from some of at least the aspirations of blockchain and crypto is they're not trying to reinvent money from first principles. And today, most of that software is written in like, you know, COBOL and Fortran on, on aging systems. So what, what would you like to say to set this out a bit more here, Stephen, of the, the argument? Yeah, I think when we start talking about like blockchain um, in a kind of fintech context, I think we kind of need to separate kind of two different kind of ideologies and camps. On the one hand, you have the kind of projects that are attempting to kind of reinvent money from first principles and the stuff we talked about on episode one, I want to build a new gold standard, I want to build some sort of transnational um, you know, currency that will transcend the regulatory perimeter in nation states. And then you have a bunch of folks that kind of also perhaps use the same word to describe things that are like, we need to make real-time gross settlement systems between banks more efficient, uh, or we need to basically figure out a way to do better parametric insurance, or we need to figure out ways to just, you know, do incremental <laughs> improvements on the infrastructure that already exists to actually serve consumer needs. And a lot of that stuff gets kind of lumped into kind of one bucket. Um, and I think we really need to kind of peel that apart because, um, you know, there are actually legitimate advances in fintech that we see happening around us all the time. And some of those things, um, if we get too hung up on the word blockchain, we have to realize that a lot of so-called blockchain technology refers to a very common software pattern, which people call like a commit log, where you basically batch up a bunch of transactions, like net out the differences between counterparties and then settle it at some point. And this is like so common in enterprise software, it's almost like ubiquitous, it's like oxygen. Um, the only problem is maybe we shouldn't be calling that thing a blockchain or something, but um, that's that's the essence of what some of these people are talking about when they talk about blockchain. So let's s peel apart the semantics of that. Very good. And so the the, the point then what you're saying, I mean, I think this so we're focused in this episode on this latter point, not the radical thing, but more like can blockchain serve incremental improvement? And then you made like almost a second point that's just worth bearing in mind because it goes on so often. It, it, I mean, it goes on in, in software and marketing in general, but a term becomes a generic term. And your point is that blockchain sometimes is almost just used to refer to innovations in doing this kind of very common database structure. Um, and, and part of the thing we want to actually really examine today is, is blockchain in the true sense of the distributed, uh, decentralized uh, version of that actually relevant or not. Um, and we'll come to that. So kind of walking forward, you said, you know, there has been a lot of fintech innovation uh, in, and kind of quantum flow into finance has a good track record of progress in the last few decades. Do you want to talk about a few of the examples there? Yeah, so I think fintech gets a bad name as just being kind of a, a new way of doing payday loans. And that, there, that, is that side of the industry, uh, but like it's it's only one side of things. And I think if people look at more of the kind of B2B stuff that happens, kind of the developments of FinTech and market infrastructure, there's a lot of really cool things that have been happening in both the fields of quantitative finance and FinTech more generally. I don't know if people have ever seen this, but like the entire uh, US New York Fed actually created an entire model of the US economy that it actually uses for a lot of its policy making. And it's all written in this giant GitHub repo in this Julia programming language. And it's actually really beautiful. Um, and so like, this is a, like, a, you know, we're basically putting the US economy on GitHub. That's a very cool idea. Um, you know, things like low cost index funds where we've given everybody kind of broad spectrum access to the market, uh, you know, a few basis points, you can get exposure to the entire S&P 500. There's been great advances in like mechanism design and economics and auction theory, which is what the Nobel Prize was for the last couple of years. Um, you know, even things like the Black-Scholes model uh, for doing options pricing is a really big advance forward in like how to like we smooth out volatility markets and price options and things we didn't know how to price before. Contactless payments are a big advance. Um, there's been great advances in like portfolio optimization, new products like parametric insurance and algo trading um, and robo advising. Uh, and a lot of these things are about giving people like more democratic access to markets and more control over their money. And yeah. um, I think it's important not to just look at the payday loan stuff and like look at the kind of B2B and like actual advances that are happening in quantitative finance because they're actually quite spectacular and quite interesting. Right, exactly. So there's kind of, there's this, there's this background um, and 
what the, the basic point what we want to kind of make those examples is that in general there's a good there's a good argument that building more complex financial models and products allows us to create more anti-fragile structures i mean uh that removal disperse risk from the broader market that the public benefits from i mean i always of course make it aside the nassim kind of taleb aside that it can also create fragility depending on the, how it's done but the online point we're trying to make here is it's possible that greater liquidity better better structures actually reduce it and that there's kind of you know we we have made advances from 100 years ago and several hundred years ago and those have actually made kind of markets more democratic more stable and just to take one example one you know we could take several you know mortgage you know although mortgage stuff again gets sometimes a bad name but like mortgage mortgage backed securities have probably actually enabled better uh, access to mortgage credit more democratic access more liquid access um you know, volatility in the price of anything from chicken nuggets to you name it has been reduced or made better by creating future products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the thesis, I think the pro version of this thesis is essentially that crypto is just an evolution of this trend. Look, we've had good uh, incremental fintech improvements. This is the evolution of that. We want to move the entire economy into in the positive sense, hyper financialized 24 seven real time, always on trading market with even more complexity and lower friction than what we had presently. And we've solved volatility problems of Alistair classes in the past. We'll do it again. It just requires more math and more sophisticated models. So what, and there's a kind of what I think we also want to emphasize is in the background, there's a very visible um, kind of problem or kind of visible example where innovation sort of hasn't been happening, which is that banks, um, most of us have experience with banks, but, but don't, don't have shown us what kind of innovation often has, hasn't looked like. They are seem to be outdated and slow to innovate. Core banking software is mostly from the 1980s. Uh, there's kind of the state of bit rock in the financial infrastructure is vast. Um, this, the infrastructure in America, but other places is outdated. We've even seen that after kind of vast effort, there's now some entrance, but even there, you know, okay, you can now do stuff on your phone. And crypto will help fix this. I mean, this is even in the original Bitcoin white paper, if you read it, is that the kind of the one of specific arguments that Satoshi makes is like, this is going to provide a better payment rail. We can transfer money to other people quickly and easily, and you won't have to wait days and depend on some weird fees and have all these issues. So this was one of the areas that crypto could fix, you know, just basic banking, let alone the rest. And in the, this wonderful future, private money and central bank digital currencies will compete for market share and they'll coexist. And there will, this will be the future of finance. This kind of Cambrian explosion is, is actually a good thing. And, the, it will even force these outdated, whether it's central banks or other banks, to kind of move into the 21st century, uh, essentially. Uh, and we'll have this, these balance sheet, these swap lines, they'll all be on some global distributed ledger, transparent, providing greater trans, you know, market transparency and efficiency. And retail accounts can be held directly at the central bank. There'll be no need for all of these banks anymore. We just can all bank with the central bank. So do you want to say a little bit more about that, that uh, or, or kind of more about how that kind of that grand vision continues? And it kind of, as we said, has kind of uh, definite, definite, um, definite strong points, particularly in the criticism of what's been what has been there. Yeah, I mean, we see this kind of vision outlined, at least in part, by President Biden's executive order. Like he's basically commissioning a great deal of the federal government to look into the whole process of like digitizing the Federal Reserve and the dollar. Like that's a huge project. Like this will span like multiple presidents, even if we get started on it. It's probably like a Manhattan level financial project at that scale. Um, so this is big stuff we're talking about here. And if you're talking about like incorporating all of Europe in it as well, you're talking about, you know, a massive global financial reconfiguration project on a scale that we largely haven't even seen since like the industrial revolution. So that's big stuff if we can pull it off. And, you know, legitimately market infrastructure is getting faster and more advanced. Um, we're very blessed here in Europe to have like kind of mostly real-time payment systems, but the Americans are kind of experimenting with that as well. And even things like everybody kind of uh, saw the GameStop saga unfold last year 
how those kind of, uh, you know, a shutdown and kind of the clearing houses between certain meme stocks that were trading. And largely the phenomenon that happened there was actually uh, not a result of any kind of uh, malice or kind of, you know, manipulation of the markets. It was the fact that the clearing infrastructure for U.S. equities actually kind of settles on like a three-day period. Uh, and so everybody's been talking about kind of building, you know, what's called like a T plus zero settlement system for equities in which basically, you know, um, trades would clear within one day, uh, you know, at the end of day or potentially like in batches throughout the day. Um, and that would be really, really great for uh, just the whole liquidity of U.S. markets. It would reduce risk. Um, you know, people would be able to kind of complete their trades much more efficiently, probably would increase liquidity in the market. And people have been talking about building that kind of infrastructure for a while now. And even over in Asia, we keep seeing... Um, you know, in China and Shanghai, if you've been there in the last couple of years, what's happening there is staggering. Uh, payments infrastructure is getting very advanced. Like, you know, your average, you know, street vendor selling, you know, you know, chicken feet in <laughs> the stall there is taking, you know, contactless payments and settling it with um, Alipay. And no, they're moving very, very fast. And a lot of these kind of real-time payments and settlement systems are going to be legitimately the future because that's where the world's headed. Um, and, you know, the notion is that, like, it's just the natural evolution that banks will simply custody thousands of types of currencies on your behalf, right? Um, and it's the nature of the regulatory cost means that the customers will just have to kind of, you know, eat the risk of having a bunch of new products, just like you do with, like, equities or other kind of financial products. It's just the banks are just going to offer more products to people. And some of those may include things like private money. So instead of going to your, you know, HSBC account and seeing just Sterling, maybe you'll see, you know, 15 or 20 different assets in your balance sheet when you hit the button on the ATM. And, uh, you know, we already see a little bit of this happening already where, you know, you can custody, you know, foreign currencies um, in your UK account and, you know, the bank will just figure out the right kind of financial product behind the scenes to kind of give you exposure to those products. And that seems to be just the way the world's headed. You know, this, the thesis continues. Regulation is becoming more robust. We've got Basel three, and it will catch up with technical innovation. You know, this is always the way things have worked in the past, and it, it's more or less worked. Um, obviously, there have been times when there have been breakdowns, as we were aware, we're aware, like the last financial crisis, you could say, in some sense, was an issue of regulatory uh, for regulation falling behind innovation of some kind. But we no longer have an economy that runs on two new era for individuals, bank balance and credit score. We need to create programmable money whose representation is a hypersurface, if you like, on a polytype that exists in extremely high dimensional spaces that's constant for every aspect of personhood. I mean, that's that vision of like multidimensional, all the money and the different kinds of like tokens you can have. And it's common uh, to have a knee jerk reaction to financial complexity. But when you dig into the details, it's quite a bit more nuanced than it seems at first glance. Well, these there are toxic products, and complexity can kind of can kind of hide uh, kind of corruption, if you like, or rip off. We also complexity can also be valuable. We need to take things on a case by case basis rather than a break write off of financialization. And the Roman Empire was trading option contracts for God's sake. Derivatives will always arise naturally in markets of sufficient sizes. And these types of products are natural for portfolio managers to use to hedge their exposures to complex factors. Trading digital derivatives contracts detached from any underlying or benchmark are the next evolution of markets. And if we can create completely synthetic hedges for a wide variety of real phenomenal factors, then it doesn't really matter how we do it. So the thing is, and, and you know, can even go a little bit further. So that's even just like creating new kinds of derivatives, new kind of synthetic products that, that represent kind of some version of value or something. But even if we get to the idea of exclusively narrative driven uh, things, you know, there are a few asset classes that are already exclusively narrative driven already rather than mathematics or cash flow driven. Um, if take gold, if gold appears to be a hedge for anything, it's the fear of inflation or the fear of financial instability as proxied by change in government's deficits. And the demand for gold is at least partially generated by emotion and politics. This is, you know, this may be squishy, but it's quantifiable. And with crypto, we can create, with their tokens, we can create new synthetic assets whose demand curves are artificially generated by psychological forces. Gold is a proxy asset for investing in the libertarian project, 
With crypto, we can create a proxy asset for investing in the anarchist project or the Marxist project. It's, it, it, so in that sense, I think there's this one point, this is a point just to mention where this fintech incrementalism, which is like, in a, in a sense, as you just mentioned, we already have gone from just having U, UK pounds or US dollars in your bank account to having more currencies. That's already quite a radical change and the ease with which it is of the last few decades and even the last decade. This is just a trend to continue. And this is a moment where the incrementalism does cross over a bit with the grand divisions of kind of um, representing value, you know, or we can value other things. But this, this and almost a democratic and kind of libertarian vision, anyone, you know, people can, there's no one, there's no one, there's, you know, you can create the currencies or the assets or the crypto tokens you want. and. I want to say a bit more about this, Stephen, and the, the, you know, where this kind of this vision of markets and finance is going. Yeah, I mean, this is admittedly a very kind of radical and allegedly quite transformative notion where we basically are starting to build money as no longer being kind of a single numerator anymore. Money is now this sort of higher dimensional concept that like perhaps even exists like you know, in some super high dimensional space, which corresponds to kind of some aspect of your life. And we've already seen this today, we have like a credit score, you have your bank account balance. So it's kind of this two dimensional kind of representation of your, your worth as a person, if you will. Um, now, what, what if we just expand that to be like a 126 dimensional kind of structure that kind of models your, your existence in the financial world. And that goes to this kind of really broader vision about macroeconomics, like markets no longer exist exclusively to price products uh, and goods and services anymore. We can financialize purely imaginary things that are untethered to like humanity and or the physical world. Um, and this flows out of like Web3. Web3 at its core is about like the financialization of everything, like abstract notions of like things like public goods and even abstract concepts like justice, politics, ideology, religion, philosophy, and community um, can be transformed into financial products that can be traded. Um, and this could be something as simple as like, you know, um, like Manchester United is selling a token now. It's called a fan token what's the basis for what's the demand curve for the fan token generated by oh it's a narrative if you like the you like the football team and people buy it and then speculate on the you know the volatility of it in conjunction with how the team plays now the demand curve for this token is completely generated by nothing there's no economic activity or there's no dividends or returns it's basically purely a narrative generated asset and so this concept is that like these completely non-physical fundamentalist greater fool assets um, can be sold as kind of this new hyper-financialized fictitious commodity whose demand curve is generated by some abstract thing uh, and psychological forces much in the way that kind of gold is sort of generated by these things. And that this all may sound very squishy and sort of humanistic, but it's actually something that with enough math and with enough models, we can actually kind of quantify. And that these kind of like self-fulfilling herborous derivatives by which the value of the derivative is completely detached from anything in the real world or any kind of cash flows or commodities or currencies, they can just exist unto themselves. And that the next step in the kind of evolutionary tree of homo economicus is a world in which all of our humanity basically just sublimates into the free market entirely. And we all become sort of commodities to be traded and psychological factors to be kind of factored into models, which give rise to this kind of new, um, very hyper-financialized, some might say utopia, some might say dystopia, but that's the world that some of these people see. So, so I think that's, and so that kind of sums up. So just to recap the prose thesis, it, there's, there's a first point of almost blockchain and crypto is going to simply is this kind of the next step in our in our innovation, our fintech innovation. Sometimes it even gets confused with fintech innovation in general. But what we're then saying is, as an extension, there can be a kind of almost a small part of that. But as it gets as it, the extension of it is this quite big vision of and, and starts to connect with this Web three vision of sort of positive financialization of everything. So let's come to the critique. Uh, now, so that's that's the kind of the thesis uh, as it's set out. 
and I think that just to be clear, there's going to be quite a bit of different things to examine. There can be just like, is it a better, it is, does it turn out that Bitcoin or anything else is just a better payment rail? Is it an easier way to move money between people up to this grand vision of we can now, uh, you know, financialize more things. We can have this more multidimensional, this richer uh, kind of financial understanding or metric of people. Um, so, yeah, let's let's start with that. Uh, what so what's the first kind of part of the critique, Stephen, of this position? Yeah, I think the best critique of what I would call like the blockchain program um, is that a lot of it seems to not be revolving around decentralization, but around a term that's called recentralization, uh, which is basically the process of creating basically similar or nearly similar structures that already exist simply with kind of new people at the helm of those structures. And those structures are not necessarily decentralized in any kind of meaningful sense. They're basically the same kind of centralized structures as before, but now they simply have new owners and new rent seekers attached to them. And that's a debatable question whether that's actually progress. That's kind of just you know transferring from here to there, right? It's basically creating a new set of Plutarchs. Um, and the financialization project, if we look at the kind of grand arc of history, there's been a lot of very, very smart people who have thought that they figured out some sort of, you know, anti-fragile model by which we can, you know, remove volatility from markets. And I think the, the biggest uh, catastrophe from our history was this, this fund called Long-Term Capital Management, yeah. which was actually run by two Nobel Prize winners, actually Martin and Scholes, actually, um, who, uh, you know, basically created this fund which traded the most bizarre exotic options, uh, sorry, exotic derivative products, uh, and they were just absolutely levered to the hilt on debt. And hey, you know, for a long time, this, this fund, people thought it was going to print money, that they figured out this kind of secret formula that they could crack Wall Street and kind of remove all of the volatility in the market and produce consistent revenue. And uh, this fund went very, very badly. Um, and the exact details about why it went badly are largely because of like over the complex financial engineering. Um, and if you look at the history of you know, co-op funds, uh, this is long running bet between like Warren Buffett, um, he was kind of a value investor. Um, and he made a bet with some other people in the field about whether, you know, um, a you know, index fund would outperform several, a basket of actively managed quant funds. And Warren Buffett actually won the bet because it turns out like, you know, despite all of the complexity and all the sophistication of these funds and all their access to new types of financialization products, they don't actually outperform the market generally as a whole um, as compared to just straight up buying the S&P. Um, and so despite all of the evidence, it doesn't seem like we have yet figured out a you know, consistent way to understand market volatility and make predictions about markets um, on a large scale. And so quantitative finance has some track records, but it's not a golden bullet by any means. I think, and I think we want to distinguish something here that's kind of useful about innovation of, of various kinds. So I, there are things that we talked about earlier, like there are clearly a desire to settle, uh, to, to settle transactions quicker and more efficiently. I mean, we could go back, you know, hundreds of years, you used to have to set letters. Things of speeding up is something that digital technology has generally done outside of blockchain. And it's something that's prob is probably useful. We just thought, you know, we want a T plus zero equity settlement system. The thing that seems, the, the other critique to say here is just on the most basic use case, which was um, interpersonal payments, blockchain and oh, certainly Bitcoin has proven to be so far no better. In fact, significantly worse in terms of transaction fees and complexity than the system from Visa, we want a better Visa, we want a better uh, payment system with lower fees and so on. But it just seems that that is the kind of stuff of classic standard financial incremental innovation. And we don't need all the complexity of a decentralized, um, you know, crypto ledger, blockchain ledger for this. Um, I think that's, I, mean, I think that's kind of, there's this kind of point one is to say, hey, you know, maybe, and it's an open question, maybe Bitcoin or some other coin will be super efficient in terms of moving money around. Um, but at the moment, it isn't, it hasn't been winning that race. And in other areas, that just there seem like promising approaches to get there that don't require blockchain. Um, 
I think that that's the, and the second point we're making here, which you're kind of emphasizing is when it comes to innovating entirely new ways of doing things. So not just like we're trying to kind of, as it were, run kind of have a, you know, have a more efficient settlement system, but we're actually inventing new financial products, particularly ones which are complex and opaque. There's significant risk and not necessarily clear upside um, on it. So the, you know, the global financial crisis from 2008 was a warning sign about opaque markets, complex products, and moral hazard, in the, particularly in the presence of uh, government bailouts. People did incorrectly price risk. Um, the financial innovation and complexity wasn't also generating a lot of social value, uh, but it was, it was easy, even within sophisticated actors, it was leading to misunderstanding of incentives and uh, risk that was being taken on. And Chris, crypto would exaggerate uh, exacerbate all of these problems. Um, there are every week there are DeFi projects that are blowing up. Um, you know, Molly, uh, Molly Schwartz does a great job of just documenting many of these in Web3 is going great uh, if you haven't checked out that site. And th the point is just simply that the rate of, of uh, a failure there seems pretty high. And, you know, million, millions, billions of dollars of social value simply cease to exist because of software bugs. Um, DeFi is a consumer protection nightmare, and Elizabeth Warren is right to war warn about this. Um, if we were concerned about mortgage-backed securities like the NIMBY, uh, no income, no, or Ninja, no income, no jobs, no assets, loans in the 2000s, you could be worried now when you have crypto exchanges offering people 100 times leverage and things like that. Um, and there's this, to kind of add, so there's, there's, there are clear reasons there are risks, and and particularly about these products. And there's also a real question of like, what are they bringing? There isn't a lot of evidence of this particular innovation is useful in kind of exotic derivative products or to have a like a thousand different weird currencies, many of which could be scams, but we don't know. And there's this massive disconnect. Secondly, there's this massive disconnect between what is theoretically promised with regards to black chain technology versus what is actually possible or realizable when we factor in real world constraints. Do you want to say a bit more about that, Stephen? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's all good and well to kind of talk about like the idealized financial system as we'd like to see it. But then when people start bringing in kind of blockchain technology or crypto tokens, there often tends to be this kind of disconnect where the technology is often a solution in search of a problem to solve attached to a speculative investment, which raises some sort of moral hazard concerns about the whole promise of the thing. But at the end of the day, you know, we're 13 years into the whole crypto project and uh, it is still a talking point that the media will go through about like, what actually is all of this for? Um, because um, like, like you said before, like Bitcoin as a, as a currency is a failure. Nobody denominates any kind of like goods or services in it. It's too volatile to write loans in and, and no contracts are denominated for the most part. So it's basically a payment rail that really sucks at being a payment rail. Um, and even projects like, you know, stable coins um, seem to be kind of re just reinventing banks from first principles, but without consumer protections. So it's not clear that that's actually moving us forward. It seems to be kind of moving us backwards. And even things like algorithmic stable coins are these kind of like, you know, theoretical ideas about creating hypothetical stable, um, you know, currencies that are balanced against a basket of goods uh, have a pretty terrible track record of just kind of blowing up catastrophically. And when they blow up, they kind of, you know, within seconds, the entire, you know, stable coin can just cease to exist. It's like a bank run, but at warp speed. Um, that to me is a scary proposition. And what I see happening across the entire crypto space is there's not a whole lot of real kind of use cases that are kind of extremely evident um, even to people that are very like financially sophisticated work on market infrastructure. We can't really point at like, what is this actually solving? And what we actually see are kind of like a lot of like financial perpetual motion machines being promised under ideas that sound like science fiction to generate large, large amounts of initial investment, but they don't really have a great track record. And even if people do talk a big game about like this new digital financial paradigm, um, that does not seem to be what a lot of people in crypto seem to be building. Um, they seem to be building a lot of sort of flash in the pan investments that kind of exist to, well, at their best, um, you know, kind of fail spectacularly while the insiders kind of walk away with a bunch of the investor money. And uh, 
that to me seems to be kind of recreating some of the worst speculative excesses that we saw leading up to 2008. And so that's that's the concern that I think a lot of the public should have when they kind of look at this you know grand vision kind of detached from uh, the reality of what's actually being built in the market today. And then let's talk a little bit just because the classic argument for crypto has been as a payment system. That was it's almost the original basic argument, sorry, for Bitcoin was it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's digital cash, decentralized digital cash. And as a payment system, it, how has it performed, Stephen, it, so far in that sense? So crypto as a payment, rail, I mean, I mean the speculative coins. Um, yeah is basically uniformly worse than basically any other service that exists, like your Western unions, your visas, your ACHs, right? The price risk, given kind of the volatility of the underlying asset is complete non-sort of commerce. Like you're not gonna go walk into a pub and like, you know, try to pay with your Bitcoin. And then by the time you try to settle with the, the tab, you know, the price of Bitcoin has moved, you know, 30 X because Elon Musk, you know, tweeted something. That's just not how you can ever kind of you know, use a, you can't use a hyper volatile asset for commerce. It just doesn't make any sense. And even worse than that is that you can't denominate contracts in it or like issue debt products without attaching these kind of obscene risk premiums to the contract to compensate for the, both the counterparty risk and the price risk of the underlying asset. And this just introduces friction into the entire process of both doing commerce and transacting, which are the very foundations of the economy. Um, so like strictly speaking, trying to do business in Bitcoin would be strictly worse than just using things that already exist. And for clearly not much benefit because money today for the most part is already settled digitally. So the value add here is still kind of illusory. Um, Okay, and, and, and also there are, the, I mean, just on the basic point of transaction fees, the transaction fees that ultimately come up in many of these systems for, for very reasonable reasons, which is people have to do uh, the mining, they have to do uh, the proof of work. Uh, transaction fees have been significant um, in many of these systems. So when we come back to kind of retail financial services and, and the thing that people obviously feel, I think this is the thing that maybe resonated at the beginning. And as I said, it's even in the white paper, you know, it's kind of ludicrous that it takes me three days or whatever, although many times it's now not three days, but it takes me three days to send my money from me to you or, and I'm going to get charged X percent, or if I want to send it internationally. I mean, those things are disappearing already with, you know, many companies, you know, that are out there that have nothing to do with blockchain, but, Nevertheless, I think that's the feeling that resonates. But the thing to the point here is that the costs present in most retail financial services have very little to do with technology. The problem is not that we didn't come up with a distributed append only ledger before. Transaction costs associated with payments, particularly, include fraud mitigation, transaction reversal, custodial services, customer service, and compliance. Um, these are necessary and probably a removable part of dealing with the needs of real people. Um, and they aren't going to go away. They require you to have call centers or to deal with the fact that someone fraudulently took money from your account somehow or other, and that that should be restored to you or that you should file a complaint or your card got stolen or all the other things that happen in real life. Um, people want to be able to reverse transactions in certain circumstances. People want transaction privacy. They want forward protection. Um, those things are pretty essential. They're not there due to some conspiracy, but because of actual real consumer demand. Um, and for crypto solutions, if they were to work, would have to be lower cost or lower friction um, on any of these. And at the moment, to the extent that they are, it's largely because they've completely removed fraud mitigation and compliance, I mean, almost altogether um, at multiple levels of the stack. Um, not only, not only at the level of just consumer uh, compliance and fraud, but at the higher level of kind of the, the operations. If we added compliance back to crypto payment whales, um, it's really unclear and in fact unlikely there would be any efficiency increase or cost savings. In fact, it might even be worse because the infrastructure running a large decentralized distributed database is quite a lot more complicated than running a, dis a distributed, uh, but not fully decentralized kind of banking system. So. Let's come to another example, which is the remittance use case, which is another example that's brought up as a kind of, we could make remittances better. Do you want to talk to that one a bit, Stephen? Yeah, this is a classic one that always comes up. Is it like somehow we're going to use like 
you know, crypto or Bitcoin to basically do international remittances. And international remittance flows are actually a huge business in the world. You know, like the money, amount of money that flows between like, I don't know, like India and the United States, is like massive. Um, and this is done by services that are like, well, bank transfers at one level and then things like Western Union and TransferWise and everything. Um, and the good news is that that's been more or less kind of in a race to the bottom uh, for a while that like transaction fees and like the solutions for doing that has been kind of generally brought down. Uh, but like the problem that crypto has versus the problem that the traditional solutions don't is that you still have to convert to and from the local currency on both legs of the payment, right? So if I want to go from dollars, um, you know, to ruples or something, um, you know, you know, the money you're wiring to grandma, she has to go to the supermarket to buy food with it. She's not going to buy food with Bitcoin. Okay, right. So then basically what TransferWise does is basically goes directly from dollars to ruples by basically, you know, creating this, this pool of money and then netting out specific transactions that go bi-directionally. Um, and that's a very well understood way to do remittances, actually. Um, now, if you add a crypto token in here, you basically still have dollars to ruples, but now you have a third layer that just sits in there for no reason. Um, you're basically going from dollars to Bitcoin to ruples. Um, and... At the same time, the Bitcoin is going to sit in there or whatever crypto volatile asset you have in there is just going to introduce uh, an exchange risk between the two national currencies. So what is this actually doing? Um, you know, it's a very indirect way of doing a cross-border payment. It's basically just doing the kind of two-hop transaction. So why is introducing this third leg of the entire payment thing um, Introducing like a third hyper volatile intermediary step just adds more risk and adds more cost to this entire transaction. And given the fact that like existing services have already basically figured out how to do this um, and have basically lowered the cost down to basically about as rock bottom as they can go with compliance, um, what does this problem does this solve? Um, so the remittance one is one of those things that people love to talk about, but when you actually dig into like the brute market infrastructure details about how that industry actually works, there's no value add there. It doesn't make any sense a priori. Absolutely. And to emphasize here, we're talking with the FinTech incrementalism story. There are topics we've talked to in other podcasts. It might be like, you're, you know, on the libertarian argument, there's an oppressive state. You want to send money somehow around their barrier. Those are other topics and we could kind of discuss it and, and evaluate them in other episodes. Here, we're just talking about the basic point of making it more efficient. And that's the key thing here. It doesn't really understand how it makes it more efficient unless the whole world has somehow allowed payments in Bitcoin, which is a long way off if it will ever happen. Um, so in terms of, let's come another one is the central bank digital currencies. You know, we're gonna have innovation there. Um, and this is a theoretical idea that's yet to prove its merits. It will involve, if it does happen, upending the entire space of commercial banks in a massive financial reconfiguration project, which needs political will. This does not currently exist in either European or United States. China could be a different story, but the reason they would want to install such a system is entirely different from Western democracies. And it's unclear what advantage this actually offers to end consumers. Facebook Libercoin offers a stark reminder about the realities of integrating with global finance and the regularly pushback against the idea of private money. Oh, so the other area might be none of our models have any predictive power to value crypto assets that present as investments. And do you want to talk a bit more about this one, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, this goes to the notion that we can use crypto assets as a kind of substitute for the kind of investments people would normally do on like the stock or the bond market, right? And that people just basically just want to trade this. This goes a little bit back to kind of the market fundamentalist view that we kind of spoke about in early episodes. But like the idea is that, well, people want to, um, you know, save for retirement and normally they would invest in the stock market and index funds and mutual funds, but now they should invest that in crypto. Um, the problem with this perspective is that if you look at crypto assets as an investment, um, it, it's unclear where the value comes from because they, they present as well, they are um, sentiment driven sort of greater fool products that are effectively zero sum, by which that mean, mean that like for every one winner, there's going to be an equal loser in the product. So these things are not generating value at a civilizational level. There's wealth redistribution mechanism. Yes. Um, that's not contributing to capital formation and like developing in productive enterprises or like, uh, you know, producing inflows of cash streams. Um, 
the price of a Bitcoin is simply what the next fool will pay for it. Um, and so this, from a pure fundamental financial analyst perspective, um, is not necessarily a great place for retail to park their money for things like retirement and saving for like, you know, the kid's college fund. Um, yeah. And when we go to quantitative finance, we say, oh, well, can we actually value these things anyways? Because we have valuation models for things like, you know, for we have just kind of cash flow model for equities. We have, you know, black shoals for options, but there's no model for crypto because there's no fundamentals and there's no intrinsic structure that we can analyze. As opposed to things like the stock to flow model, but they have no predictive power to actually explain the transformation of these assets. And so like fundamentally, like what quantitative finance would say is the fundamental value of these assets is strictly zero. And we don't know how to value them. There's no reliable mathematical valuation model for these products. And so that presents as a significant risk at best and like a form of kind of predatory inclusion at worst by which people who are excluded from the stock market are forced to invest in this very strictly inferior asset class because they have no other choice. No other choice or that kind of, yes, to see. I think I also want to emphasize something here maybe to, to listeners that, that, that in general, for example, the, the investment history of gold is not a good one. Um, although people clearly have held gold uh, and particularly in older periods, but in the last hundred 150 years, gold has not been a great asset to hold. Um, it's certainly done a lot worse than equities. It's done worse than real estate. Um, it, and it's obviously also at a civilization level, I think this is important to add, um, it's, not, um, it's not a productive asset. When you put money in gold, you're not financing, you're not supporting some productive endeavor of any kind. You're literally just holding like an inert metal. Um, in a vault somewhere. So there's this kind of, even something like gold, which if that would be the aspiration of some of these things, it's like it, it, that there's kind of a, there's haven't been a great thing for people to invest in. It's like new, like an amazing new financial product. Um, it, if it was just more gold, okay, maybe a bit useful, but not that useful. And we do have now all kinds of other innovations, like there are government uh, backed kind of infl inflation linked securities. There are other things that allow people to hedge inflation risk. Um, and of, I, mean, I should of course say we could come here and it'd be, it is in a covered in other episodes so on the Bitcoin side there's always the argument that, you know we don't like the state the state may do, you know all these things may go away but in that case you know hold land and it's not really clear why your title to your Bitcoin on your USB key will be any safer than your house or an equity investment in a company when if everything really goes wrong so it's unclear also what crypto assets offer the institutional finance or asset managers other than their current participation, almost in like it could become gold and then it would be worth X trillion and we should have had a stake in that. Um, it adds maybe some beta to a portfolio and exposable to a quantifiable black box risk. But you can talk about this more in the market fundamentalist method. I mean, it's understandable why certainly traders are interested in crypto because it's a fast new arena for trading. But as a general overall product, we're not sure what it adds to the financial industry sector. And then coming to the last point, and you know, one which we're going to explore in more detail, I think, in another episode, but it's what I call kind of the metricization of everything. And where there's kind of we at least myself, there's a sympathy to at least some part of that position, which is we currently have very crude, certainly financial metrics uh, for many things that are important in our world. The issue, as we'll maybe discuss in that episode, is not though that we need to kind of create new tokens. Um, I could create a token for love tomorrow. I don't necessarily need crypto for it. I could just create it and say like, I want people to hold this and they kind of give it to people when they experience love. The, the creation of a token for something doesn't mean that it actually gets more valued. And we can currently value love or the environment in many ways today using US dollars. We can go and spend money on things that protect the environment or that generate love in the world uh, in whatever way that we think. Um, more pictures of bears on Twitter. Um, the thing, the thing that, we, that we're trying to get at here is that in general, that building and so, but coming, taking all of that, maybe there is some value in the area. But in general, building an enormously complex social credit system based on the tokenization of everything, on financialization, every aspect of our lives, certainly has a major risk of being dystopian versus utopian. Um, people who've ever seen Black Mirror have multiple examples of this in which every aspect of our lives becomes kind of subject to, to a cost. 
Um, it's not compatible with our values of individual people, liberty and privacy necessarily as well. And there are just major risks in doing this. It may be, as I said, there are, there are, there is utopian potential, and this is something we should investigate in more depth, but it, it seems obvious downsides and a lot of complexity before this actually works. And most of the examples today don't really seem to have much water to them. Finally, we've got arbitraging securities regulation for crowdfunding, um, which is another area of the fintech regulate, uh, innovation that we have talked about a bit on other episodes, of the securities episode and on the market fundamentals. Do you want to talk a bit on to that one, though, today, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, this goes to what the episode we did on the securities regulation, which I think was episode number three. Um, and so this is the kind of thesis that there may be some truth in this one, actually, is that, you know, crypto tokens are basically a way of doing, you know, a proxy for equity crowdfunding for early ventures that lets basically anybody in the world participate in company formation as a way of kind of circumventing the normal securities regulation that occurs around issuing equity to shareholders. Right. And so this basically lets anybody in the world, any teenager from their parents' basement can basically turn, run an IPO and potentially collect, you know, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of notional value in crypto assets uh, pooled on a project which doesn't even have a product, um, doesn't have any kind of revenue, doesn't actually have a business model. Um, and we see that all the time happening with the, these token projects that are happening and people are just piling in, you know, notional value into these endeavors that um, at their best are kind of very high in the sky and at their worst are outright scams. Um, and it's not clear that, you know, there's a great amount of upside to having every single early company formation behave exactly like an IPO because IPOs are generally quite regulated for a very good reason, because that's when the time you can finally bring the public in to participate in capital formation. Um, and those rules exist for a very good reason. Um, and so circumventing the securities framework, um, while it's technically possible, and it's actually kind of interesting from a fintech perspective, it seems like from a regulatory and sort of just moral hazard perspective, that doesn't seem like to be a great state of being for markets. So, and just to mention, see our securities episode for a bigger dive on that. And then we're coming to the last couple of items here. So one is that there's the question of permission blockchain, uh, which is kind of, yeah, I mean, uh, a, a kind of fancy distributed database here, we might say, is a technology removed from token issuance? Does it have any applications? The answer at the moment, and I know that Stephen's a real expert here, seems like a no, but if it's a yes, it's probably for relatively mundane things. Um, what kind of things, like there's things like Corda, there's the Walmart Fruit Network project, and overall, this is, doesn't seem like paradigm shifting tech. It's more enterprise software-like, uh, something running on the, the back office in the bank or the, the company. Um, useful, uh, but certainly not revolutionary. And it's really unclear whether blockchain actually turns out to be relevant for that. Um, after certainly now almost half a decade or a decade of that, there isn't a lot to show for it. So what about, we're still looking in short for crypto's killer use case in the area of fintech improvements. Even if we accept that expansion of advanced financialization is a good thing, it's unclear what crypto offers to this program when brought within the regulatory perimeter, which I think almost everyone agrees should happen to some extent, uh, at least within maybe there's those some and we explore that others the, 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 who are not on that view. But if we assume that that will happen, it doesn't apply for domestic payments. It doesn't really work for remittances. Uh, or doesn't bring value, especially there. It doesn't help with speculative investments, maybe on central bank digital currencies, but that's a long way off uh, and uncertain. Maybe on enterprise data management, maybe, maybe, and everything else is science fiction or possibly even dystopian at present. In short, what we have here, as I understand it, Stephen, is like an unregulated transnational payment rail. Even if it did work as people claim, and then testing out in the world or live people, then it, so even if it did work, I think one of the things that we kind of want to come to here in the conclusion is uh, this concept of responsible innovation. Let's leave our minds open. We've we've done a pro case that might resonate for people. We've done the critique. The listeners sort of can make their own mind up and can read also our evaluation as we do these online. 
But there's a kind of general principled question I think we want to come to here. And that's this question around like responsible innovation, as we could put it. Do you want to talk a bit more to that, Stephen? Yeah, I think this really goes to what President Biden's talking about as well in his specific choice of language. And it is an explicit choice of language here. Um, I think I want to draw a parallel to another industry altogether. And that's the kind of self-driving car industry. So this is something that's also kind of an equally speculative space. Like we obviously don't have self-driving cars yet. But a lot of companies are pouring a lot of money in to build this thing because theoretically it's possible that we can build them. So the two big players at the moment are Tesla and Google. Um, so Google has a company called Waymo and Tesla has their full self-driving um, software that they pushed out into the cars that they're selling to the public directly. Um, and what Google is doing is they basically cordoned off um, a small area in Arizona and are running basically like a taxi service that people can kind of experiment and try out on a very, very limited basis in a very, very small area. And I think the Tesla versus the Google approach to doing innovation really highlights one of them as being kind of more adherent to kind of what we call engineering ethics and responsible innovation, and the other one as being a bit reckless. So what Tesla is doing is basically pushing full self-driving software into the cars of their customers that they're driving around today and just using them as sort of guinea pigs to kind of beta test their software. And people have died uh, because the self-driving car is still very much a kind of prototype and very much an experiment. And we've all seen the videos of a lot of these things running into traffic or just mowing down pedestrians. And like from the Tesla perspective, this is just the cost of you know doing innovation. It's just creative destruction at work. And then the kind of Google um, method is what I would consider a lot more on the kind of more responsible innovation side. It's basically trying to minimize public risk and not running experiments on the public. Um, and this is an issue that really divides technologists because it's a question about engineering ethics and like how far can you go in the pursuit of innovation at the expense of public safety. And I think there's another parallel that I'll bring up is that like in the field of machine learning, which is also another massive space, there's a vast amount of academic literature and books. And like Nick Bostrom has written a whole book on the subject about how do we handle runaway like artificial general intelligence or what's called like rogue AI. Basically you create like a self-aware machine and then basically it starts becoming aware of its existence and all sorts of bad things can happen. And people have speculated about like mitigation strategies for these things. They had these massive debates about whether this is an existential threat to humanity. Um, and there's a really enormous amount of discourse that's happened on this subject. And I think the question that we really have to ask ourselves as technologists or as regulators um, is why aren't we having that exact same conversation about something that seems to present with almost precisely the same kind of runaway phenomenon. So basically just running this kind of financial reconfiguration experiment on the public live, you know, why is there such a taboo about talking about this in the same way that we talk about like kind of rogue AI or like how do we regulate self-driving cars? And I think in both those fields, there's a great deal of ethical research and discourse and debate. And why aren't we having the same kind of debate about crypto? Yeah. And I think even at a, even if people, uh, we took a kind of like milder case, would be if people could go back now and say, given what we saw happen with social media, given what we saw happen, and, and probably not through necessarily even malintention, when people put together these algorithms, the feed, the newsfeed algorithms, with advertising, with the incentive to kind of kind of involve users. If we were to go back 20 or 30 years and know what we know now, or even 10 or 15, 20 years, we would probably take some action. We would probably proactively put a lot more time and energy into like, how can we run a healthy social network? How can we do that? And as you say, even in this milder case, which is like full of working high, and it's the point here that the stuff, you know, we, we, who knows what can we have severe financial crisis, or it could just be we've gone down a path where we've kind of financialized everything and that wasn't such a good thing. Uh, and it's hard to come back, that these aren't just things where you're easy to go back. Once you've, you know, even now, once we have social media in the way we do it, it's difficult to do a different model. And so I think this point about this kind of responsible and kind of foresightful, I would guess, regulation um, of innovation, particularly in this area. And I think to end, what, what the burden is here is what is um, the value? I mean, I, I think this is a point around financial sector in general which is 
I've known quite a few people I've known who've ended up working in um, quant in, in funds, in quant funds. And you always have this question of like, what's kind of almost a zero sum game? I mean, the best you're providing liquidity. And there's not actually a huge amount of literature showing why the liquidity growth has been that useful overall to kind of overall economic growth. We've had eras from the 50s and 60s and 70s where we had very little of this complex financial engineering. We had very robust and great economic growth. So this kind of general point about financialization improvement in fintech is it is valuable. We've talked about that in the pro section, but you've really got to ask how many points is that adding to GDP compared to the things that really, whether it's innovations in healthcare, whether it's innovation in how we run democracy, whether it's innovation in education, whether it's innovation uh, in uh, you know solar or whatever, you know other areas of our economy that seem really, really crucial and important. Um, is this is this a you know what's the, what's the upside? And there seems to be clear risk. So. Ultimately, we want to finish this episode, I think, saying that this, at least at the incremental fintech level, this is perhaps so far one of the most compelling and defensible positions. I mean, we've, we've, we've leveled the summary of the critique there at the end, but there's probably, you know, it, it's one of the ones where there's at least there's, there's open possibility in some areas. Um, but if and only if, really, if the tech can be shown to be demonstrably better than what already exists or is going to be built without blockchain. Um, there are some large economic, technical, and commercial problems, or at least unproven theories at the heart of much of the blockchain thesis about incremental financial innovation. Much of the ideas in this area remain theoretical proposition at best, or even false, like the original claim at the moment that Bitcoin would be a great way to do payment transfers. It's currently still cheaper to use your bank or to use international payment like WISE for most of this. Um, but it's still interesting to consider these intellectually. Is there anything you'd like to add in conclusion, Stephen, before we wrap up today's episode? Yeah, I mean, I would say with all of this kind of fintech and blockchain stuff, the burden of proof really remains on people to kind of show the public a very clear demonstrable use case beyond just, you know, gambling on sort of hyper volatile dog coins, right? That's a use case. It's just not one that has a particular benefit for society. Uh, and you can, turns out like the technology is really great for creating these kind of asset bubbles and people do like to gamble. They love casinos. Um, but like when you actually try to apply it to like, oh, does it actually solve this problem that we have in like, you know, reg tech or like back office processing or something, or like, does it even create a new variety of financial products that actually give us something that's actually useful? Um, and who is it useful for? And this is a critique that you can absolutely level at many aspects of the traditional financial services sector. Like there are lots of extremely bizarro derivatives out there that are like, you know, tied to some sort of benchmark of energy production in Botswana, and then also tied to like the temperature of like, you know, the rainforest. These are products that exist today and people buy them. And a lot of them are sort of very questionable utility. Um, and so let's not say that we can't make the same criticisms that we're making about crypto about some of the kind of more excesses of the traditional financial system. Absolutely, you can. Um, but really, if we're talking about doing this kind of massive financial reconfiguration project, moving us toward a much more hyper-financialized world, um, there's a much stronger burden of proof on the people claiming that there is an upside to actually demonstrate this. And I think there needs to be a kind of rogue AI kind of machine learning kind of level of inquiry on the space, because I think it presents with largely much the same kind of existential risk to humanity because financial shocks and financial panics and manias are you know destructive forces in the world and if there's one thing that we've learned from the history of you know finance is that the story that this time it's different but the lesson of history is that it's never different like so that's the final point i'll leave on for today financialization to be taken with a very grain of salt yes and history maybe doesn't repeat but it rhymes with that, I would like to wrap up our episode today. If you're keen to find out more, check out web3.lifeitself.us uh, for a whole rich wiki covering many of the concepts, uh, more in these evaluations of the key claims, as well as uh, more interviews with key people in the space. Thank you very much for everyone for listening today. And until next time, so long from both of us. Cheers.